yet still in control and worthy to be praised. Our call to worship. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for its own Thank <laughs> you. 
morning to you once again. It's good to be with you this morning. We are still dealing with a difficult, trying time, but I am aware God is able. I'm aware that God is still in control. Amen. There's some other folks that think that they in control but God is still yet in control. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, Colossians, the second chapter, the 16th verse, we will find our text for this morning. Colossians, the second chapter, and the 16th verse. And it reads, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to festival or new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. And the, worship, and the worship of the angels. Taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. Amen. We want to continue our study in Colossians, and this morning we want to talk about Christ versus rules, rituals, and spiritism. Christ versus rules, ritual, and spiritism. And as we have seen uh, through our study in Colossians, there were many things that continued to seep in the church, and this is, once again, proof that rules, rituals, and spiritism was things that were seeping into the church, and unfortunately, we can still see the same thing today. I wonder, we have the Word of God, we study the Word of God, we look at the Word of God over and over again, but yet we continue to do some of the same things. My question would be to all of us, when will we learn? And I could just imagine God sitting on the throne wondering, when will his children learn? This passage pits Christ against two false teachings that have hounded men down through the ages. False teachings that are constantly infiltrating the church, as well as attacking the man out on the street. Christ versus rules and rituals. Every thinking person knows that we have to have rules and laws in order to live in a controlled and just life. But when we adopt a rule, at some point we fail to keep it. And somehow, some way, we just fail and come short of keeping the rule perfect means something of a critical importance to us this morning. We can never approach God and become acceptable to God through rules or laws or rituals or through anything else we might undertake by our own efforts. You say, well, why is that, preacher? I'm glad you asked. It's because God is and to approach God, we have to be perfect. But this is the very problem of human life. We are already imperfect, and we can never be perfect because we have already failed. How then can we ever become acceptable to God who very nature demands perfection? There is only one way through the love. 
glory and gospel of Jesus Christ. When we trust the righteousness and perfection of Jesus Christ, then God counts our trust in his son as righteousness. When we focus upon God's son, and that is uh, when we honor Christ with our trust and our lives, God honors us for honoring his son, and God honors us by counting us righteous and perfect in the righteousness of Christ. But look at this. The emphasis of the present passage is upon focusing and concentrating upon Christ. God's Son, and God the Father, His Son, with, with an eternal love, the greatest love in existence. God accepts any person in His Son. And no person out of his son. He honors any person who completely trusts his son. And no person who comes short of complete trust in his son. The false approach to God. Through the shadows of rules and rituals and judging others by them. Rules and rituals were the problem that had seeped into the Colossian church. Some believers were reverting back to rules and rituals and judging others by them. Some false teachers were diverting the attention of some believers away from Christ. And they were saying that rules and rituals were to be the focus of man's attention and life. And they were saying that man became acceptable to God keeping certain rules and rituals. They were saying that Man pleased God by eating and drinking the right foods and by keeping certain religious rituals holy days. How this teaching led a person to focus upon rules and rituals instead of Christ. This emphasis found its roots in the false teaching of Gnosticism, which had seeped into the Colossian church. Here's the thought. People tend to approach God by keeping rules and uh, uh, that discipline their body and their minds and their spirit. A person feels that God will accept him if he can present himself to God with a body that is clean and more. Uh, they believe that God will accept them if, if he can present himself to God with a spirit that is religious and that keeps the ritual and holy days of religion. Or a, a life that serves and gives. All of those may be good. But the true approach to God is through Christ. The only acceptable body. The true approach to God is Christ. Rules and rituals are shadows in approaching God. Christ is the real body that enables us to approach God and to please him. Point is this. Christ was the perfect son of God. He kept all the rules of the law and never broke a single rule. He was sinless. He was the perfect man. And he stands before the human race as the ideal man. 
spirituals were shadows that were used by God before Christ came. They were used by God to teach me that nothing could provide real life, not the real substance of Christ that satisfies and gives absolute assurance of the living forever with God. No rule, no ritual can give life and assurance to me. Rules and rituals are only inanimate, left, lifeless objects, but not Christ. He is a living person who can relate and infuse the very life and assurance of God into the heart of a person. Rules and rituals may point us toward God, but they are never not but they are not the real substance of life. Christ is the real substance of life. The only substance, the only body and life that can bring us to God and present us as acceptable to God. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 tells us, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Romans chapter 10 verse 3 tells us, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone Corinthians 8 and 8. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. And 2 Timothy 3 and 5 says, holding to a form of godliness. Although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. And unfortunately today,
to defraud or to cheat a person out of his reward. It's possible for believers to be cheated out of their reward by false teaching. By following those who teach that there is another approach to God other than Christ. And I don't know about you this morning, but I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want to be cheated. Therefore, I'm going to follow and stick to the word of God. Christ and God's appointed way to approach him, and there is no other way. False approach to God. Spiritism was through the worship of angels were spirits and visions. The false approach to God now being discussed uh, is spiritism, the the worship of God through these angels, spirits, and visions. And again, the Colossian church had been heavily influenced by Gnostic teaching. Mediators between God and man. The word goes into great detail about what he has seen. This is the reference to vision, seeing into the spiritual realm, into a world other than the physical world, and some of the believers were claiming all kinds of visions. Visions of spiritual beings and of angels, and, uh, and, 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 and so often happens when people have deep spiritual experiences, the Colossians begin to focus upon the visions and the angels whom they claim were appearing to them. And they focused upon the spirits instead of Christ. And let me just pause there. If somebody's focusing on tongues and spirits and dreams and all these other things more than Christ, run. Because there's a problem. The focus is not on any of that. The focus ought to be on Christ Jesus. Men tend to feel God is far off in outer space, some place or in some unreachable dimension of being, and at least unreachable to the common person. They feel too sinful and unworthy to approach God or to secure God's interest and care. They feel the need for mediators or negotiators or facilitators to stand between them and God and Mediators who can present them and, and their lives and their situations to God. As a result, men tend to look and pray to lesser beings such as angels or spirits or departed saints. Others turn to seeking visions or deep spiritual experiences in order to know God and secure his help. There is a false humility in this approach to God. A person who approaches God through vision and spirit is claiming that he is unworthy to approach God himself. And he needs others to appear before God for him. But this is false humility. For the person who claims that to have visions of angels or spirits which other people do not have. Some the Colossian church were claiming that they possessed special gifts. They had experienced special visions. Yet they were unworthy of such experiences. There was a voluntary, self-imposed air of humility about them that really came across as being more spiritual than other believers. And Paul says that they were deceived and that they were in danger of losing their reward. They were puffed up with idle notions. 1 Corinthians 4 6 says, Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying. Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of the one of us over against the other. Here's the point. Spiritism focuses attention 
upon the spiritual experience. The angels, the spirits, the visions, not on God's appointed way to approach him, which is Christ Jesus. And a person's mind and thoughts were centered more on the spiritual, the spiritual experience than on Christ. Christ is relegated to a lower position in the person's life than the spirits and visions. A person seeks to have visions of the spirits more than he seeks Christ. Mark Twain sends a warning to all. He says, no one will deny the visions of the mystics, but there's always a danger when a man begins to think that he has attained a height of holiness which enables him to see what common men, as he calls them, cannot see. And the danger is that men will so often see not what God sends them, <coughs> but what they want. Secure the approval and acceptance of God for man. He is the only one who can secure the love and care of God for man. No spirit, no angel, or vision can do what Christ can do. Christ alone has access into God's presence on behalf of Christ alone stands before God as a representative or head of man. No other person or being can stand before God on behalf of man. Because the body has only one head, not two. And the answer is found in the an analogy or the picture of the human body. A body has only one head. Anything other that you see that has more than one head is a freak show. Body has one head. And God's people are a body of people. A body of people who live under the will and control of the head, who is Christ. Two things about the head. He alone supplies and nourishes life. The head is the part which supplies the the body. So it is with Christ. Christ alone can supply and nourish the body of believers. The church. Christ alone can give men the strength and nourishment of God to help them as they walk day by day through life. He alone binds life together. The head is that which holds the body together He alone can hold a person together. All the thoughts, all the emotions, and other things that are needed to make him a whole person. He alone can hold all people together as one body in love, joy, and peace, worshiping, serving, and living for God like they should. I'm reminded of the song we used to sing when we were children. He's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, he's got my brother and my sister in his hands. He's got the sun and the rain in his hands. He's got the rivers and the mountains in his hands. He's got everybody in his hands. Not only that, he's making it all work and function like it should. The point is well made. Man cannot approach God, nor receive the help of 
spirit or angel, a vision can bring the supporting or nourishing power of God to men. Only Christ, God's appointed head, can support and nourish men throughout life. John 3 and 31 tells us, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. John 13 and 13 says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Ephesians 1 and 19. His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Then I'll end with this. Philippians 2 and 6. Therefore God exalted him to the God bless you, God. Keep, let us pray. Father God, we are grateful today just for who you are. We thank you so much for your son. Hung high, stretch wide for our sin. We love you today and we bless your name. Father, we thank you for those that are here. We thank you for those that may be listening, watching in their living room. Father, we ask a special blessing upon each and every Father, there are those in our congregation that have lost loved ones. Lord, we lift them up to you. Father, and pray that you would touch in a special way. Father, we know there are those that are battling with this virus. And Father, we pray that you would touch their bodies in a special way. Father, we know that you're still a healer. Father, we know that you're still God. We know that you're still on the throne. And even though it looks dark sometimes, Father, we trust you with our lives know anybody else to lean on. Father, we don't know anybody else to call on. So we call on you this morning asking that you would touch in a special way. Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. You so rightly deserve. We love you today. We bless your name. It is in the mighty, magnificent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Pray God's blessings on each and every one. Thank God for